I think our eyes often sweep over uniformity, and so if you intentionally create something that's ever so slightly obviously handmade, it provides a really good opportunity for the diner to sort of slow down. And we notice the differences. And I like to try to find that in-between feel between function and art. I'm a ceramicist that loves working with clay. Alright, so this is where I keep my clay and I work with a few different clays. And so today I'm going to throw with the brown clay. And this clay is made by a local uh, producer. I'm going to do what I call a drop rim pillow plate for a night bird. So I do pedestal bowls, vases, tableware, even cocktail glasses for the restaurant Nightbird in San Francisco. And that needs to be two pounds, 12 ounces-ish. One of the reasons that I adore clay and have been doing it for over two decades is because of its unpredictability. Ceramicists always calculate their clay shrinkage rate. I'll lose a whole inch on the width of the plate. But starting out with the same weight provides enough of a framework for it to be a collection. I know, so we're about to wedge the clay. And wedging clay, sort of thinking about getting something that's really inert into motion. I don't know, I've, I've heard chefs talk a little bit about how it's like kneading bread. But the idea also is to get air bubbles out of the clay. Each time I come upon an air bubble when I'm throwing, I have to take a needle tool and, and pinprick it out because if any air, huge air bubbles are left in the clay, they will explode in the kiln. So after you're done wedging, you make sure that you create a nice round ball so that when it's slammed down on a flat surface, all the air is pushed out from the ball and I don't create any air pockets. I try to always look in the center of the wheel and slam down turn my wheel on and sort of check, is the ball fairly in the center? The clay is completely wet when I start, and over time you'll see that it's going to slowly dry and therefore retract. The crystals of the clay, the, the particles of the clay will sort of come in on themselves. And you're trying to get the clay to move as if it was one with the wheels. All potters are going to cone up and cone down where I get my fingers way underneath this bottom part and squeeze in. And hopefully you can already see that the clay is starting to be uniform. And the idea is to get all of the clay particles moving in Congress, moving together. And one way that you're taught when you're first starting to learn how to throw is you take your finger and you check, is everything sort of hitting your finger at the same time? Next is always um, opening up a hole. The whole process is trying to control particles of clay to be moving together. I am doing an inside out rim. That's why we call it a drop rim. So I'm compressing the clay on the bottom. I'm going to be pulling the clay up and then I'm gonna be expanding it to the brink of collapse and then quickly folding it over. And I'm hooking my fingers underneath to try to keep the structure and all the clay particles supporting each other. I really modeled my business on like a high touch collaborative kind of model. I'm inspiring the chef to create their art and they're inspiring me. It's truly collaborative and that's what's exciting about it. Those little touches are, are everything. It's not just making art, it's thinking about how the art is going to help the, the experience in the end. I'm even going to try to use the sponge to finish the rim, and here I'm finishing it upside down. Think about the ease of lifting that rather than a completely round donut form that's closed and has slopes. There's an edge to catch your finger on and gracefully lift it from the table. I put my fingers down and I pull forward and we have a drop rim plate. Nine and one eighths inches. To me, that's nine inches. I'm happy. I, I want to have that standard deviation. I want it to look ever so slightly different. So after they've firmed up enough to remove off the bat, I transfer them to a wood board because this is a dry wood board and it's going to suck the moisture out from the bottom. And then once they dry a little bit more, 
Then I will finish the bottom with trimming tools. A lot of the water has been dried out of it, but the leather hard state can hold its own. I love it when it catches in the middle like that and it sort of spirals nicely and neatly. <laughs> Clay sounds different when you tap it, when it's thin, higher pitched, and thick. It's like a thunk, it's a lower, a lower pitch. So even though I can't manipulate the clay, it's too hard, I sort of have an idea on how thick everything is. I hope someone who is dining at a restaurant that chooses to work with me and they're done eating and they flip it over and they can see both my maker's mark, my stamp, but also the swirl. It's like telling a little story to the diner. All right, and then when I'm done trimming, the last thing to do at the leather hard stage is to make my maker's mark. That is a stamp that I make. These pieces have been trimmed and I'm going to slow dry them. Even drying lessens the chance of cracking because the weather can change. It could be hot during the day and cold at night. I essentially tuck them in. Good night, little plates. <laughs> and I'm gonna start loading them. So after they've dried fully, I load them up and they're ready for their bisque firing. At this stage, these plates are bisqued, meaning they um, are just come out of the kiln on a lower temperature fire. And the clay is definitely like more sturdy and solid. Check this out. I've chosen, after doing this for many years, to wet sand. Nothing is dry and you're always trying to put your health first because dry, super fine sanded dry particles, you really shouldn't be inhaling any parts of it. To wet sand it, I wet, and then I get this in really deep into the bucket, and I rub, and now I take away that dry sanded away area, and now it's completely smooth. So underneath the glaze, there are hundreds and hundreds of fingerprints because it's handmade and it's art. <laughs> so what I want to do right now is sort of define the boundaries of what I want to have glaze and what I don't want to have glaze. And I do that with a, a wax resist. If any glaze gets on the bottom of my piece and it goes on the kiln shelf and I fire it, the piece is stuck on the kiln shelf. I paint it on the bottom because that's, that's where I don't want any glaze. So these are caviar reveal dishes. So even though I've thrown them this way and they look like a bowl, they're actually presented upside down. I actually wax the rim of the bowl. The wax resist that I painted on is dry. It's not coming off. And it will repel the glaze, sort of like oil and water. Kim Altar of Nightbird definitely plates sort of off-centered, similar to how I glaze. And so I love the dialogue that that creates. So over the years, I have amassed maybe eight or nine different colors. And then the way I play with it is I really love texture. A lot of my art and practice is off-center texture. This is the black ink texture that Kim has in her um, in ink texture plates. So I hand paint all of my glazes because I want ever so slight inconsistencies. I do not want to spray paint my glazes. My goal is not to have an even surface. The little dots of the texture will be different sizes next to each other when they pull away from the clay and the firing. The glaze isn't adhering to the clay in a correct way. It's technically a mistake, but that's what makes it so interesting. I think the texture mimics what the chef plates, smooth sauces next to really bubbly, non-uniform glaze. So after the ink texture is applied, I just wanna make sure that the glaze is dried up enough so that I can apply the wax resist. And the reason I do that is because the next dip is black. And I don't want the black to overlap with the wax resist. It will mute the texture effect. So we plan it all out and I sketched it all out with her. This is my signature black glaze that I've created. Any glaze is comprised of four main categories. So one is silica, which obviously is gonna create the glass-like consistency. One is flux, which reduces the melting point of the glass. Another is a stabilizer, like aluminum, that would make sure that the glaze adheres 
to the ceramics. And then the fourth one is the oxides and the colorants. Those are what gives the glaze its color. And their reaction at certain temperatures is what creates the color. And so that, through chemistry once fired, turns into this luscious, glossy azure. You have to use your imagination not only in what might be plated on my plates, but I also use my imagination in what the color is actually gonna look like in the end. It takes a certain kind of um, faith and imagination and just experience with the process. I'm picturing not only what the chefs are going to plate on my pieces, but I'm picturing how this color is gonna look different in 48 hours after it's fired for 12 hours and cooled for 12 hours and everything in between. This plate has been glazed and dried and it is ready for the glaze firing. One of the things I'm proud of with my business is that that hasn't lost its luster. And that means that I'm doing something right. I'm pushing, I'm challenging, I'm trying to think of new things. All of that culminates in that final moment when I peek into the kiln. And this is the best part. <laughs> it really is, it never gets old. Oh, these turned out wonderful. So exciting. And this is what I love about this texture. I mean, look at this. The variation in each one. Each one looks different because it's hand painted. It's thrilling. Ah, oh, yay! <laughs> this is amazing. Look at these gorgeous reveal dishes for Kim. Oh, they turned out wonderful. This is before and after the firing shrinks and the texture comes through and then gray turns to black. Making it fresh, restaurants hire me to create some kind of plate for their special signature dishes that they really want to elevate and have them pop. Hi. Hi. And here we are. Pretty excited about how these are gonna look in motion. I think that when we are doing this, I'll plate it in the back and then we'll have the caviar tart underneath or on top and the beignet and when we drop it for guests, they have like the interaction with the plate too, you know, That's and they great. can like feel the texture and then it's like something special underneath. That's like my thought. Like when I go out to eat, the first thing I always do is go like this yes, and like flip the plate. see like who makes it and like I love when I see guests doing that in here because they're so, they've never seen anything like it. It's yeah. special. I think that the textures, like the plates to me, look like you could be going off a cliff or lava or the blackness and it just kind of really tied in to the idea of this menu. We're definitely going to start off with, you know, using these. I'm going to start off with a little beignet that we uh, cook in a siphon caviar with a smoked egg yolk and creme fraiche. That'll be the surprise and then it's ready for the guest. We're gonna do our white asparagus with escargot, a yuzu beurre blanc, and uh, all the allians. Snail caviar. We're gonna do the goth chicken. So we uh, debone the silky and make it into a little bit of a roulade. That's just the natural skin tone of the bird. And then we just slow kind of like roast the silky so we get like a nice crispy skin. So we have like a twill that kind of emulates the texture on all of the other plates. Well, I can't wait till she makes me more of these. I am really excited about this plate. Yeah. It's like lava. You start collaborating with like farmers and I think that I look at ceramicists in the same way. For me, it's very important like what the plate looks like, what it feels like, the textures on it. There's just so many components that go into the actual plate and it's the first thing that a guest sees. And when I make something by hand, I feel the intentionality, I feel the inspiration and I'm expressing myself in its utmost way. I feel so fortunate that I work with really great chefs. This is my art and it meets their passion and their art. I don't consider my artwork done and when it leaves my studio. It all comes together in this cohesive dance and the chef has made it their own.